and fell off. Hare Krishna. So, thank you for coming today for this talk on Thanksgiving. And I'm sure after some time, you will give thanks that the talk is over. <laughs> so, I'll speak on this topic in three broad parts. I'll talk about the occasion, the expression, and the intention. That means, <clears throat> that whenever any celebration happens, there is some incident, there is some historical incident because of which that particular celebration happens. Mm -hmm. Say for example Diwali, the occasion, the many occasions, one occasion is Lord Ram came back. So there is an occasion, historically what had happened. The expression is, okay, how do we express our celebration on that occasion? We light lamps over there. And then what is the intention? The intention is, that we want to welcome that the great devotee, that the devotees of Ayodhya, they wanted to welcome Lord Ram back after when he after he came back from the uh, exile. So similarly, if any festival we want to consider, we can consider these three parts. And today I'm just going to speak on this topic of the spiritual significance of Thanksgiving. So let's look at it from these three parts. Now historically. The occasion, as most of you know, is that uh, in Europe, in the early modern times, there was a war between the Protestants and the Catholics. Christianity got split into two parts over the years because of certain, certain corruption in the Catholic Church. And some of the Protestants were strongly persecuted in some of the countries where the Catholics were in rule. And then eventually, they decided to leave from there and come to America. So, usually when conflicts take place, the, the, generally the nature of conflicts is that they make us lose perspective of things. That a small thing can become very big. Once there was a Catholic nun and she was taking care of uh, some orphan girls. And as those girls grew up, we were growing up, one girl had just entered past her teenage. She says, when you grow up, what do you want to become? She said, I want to become a prostitute. She says, what? Oh, hail Mary, oh Jesus, what have you spoken? She says, what did you say, oh girl? She said, I want to become a prostitute. Oh, thank God. I thought you wanted to become a protestant. <laughs> <laughs> So, sometimes that sometimes when there are differences between some groups in the religion, the small differences can be made so big that major moral differences, they become trivialized. So, anyway, these Protestants were persecuted and they came to this distant land of America. And they landed here at that time and they eventually made the safe journey and they came here. They celebrated in gratitude that they had made this journey and they had found a new land. The celebrations that they did, that historically has led to the celebration of Thanksgiving. So the idea that idea of Thanksgiving is the occasion historically was something. Now many people when they celebrate, they don't even know what the occasion is. In general, we human beings are social creatures and we need some reason for socializing. So festivals across human history and across human ge geography help people to come together. And our routine life tends to become humdrum, boring. So they create some kind of brick in the routine life. Now, originally, most holidays were meant to be holy days. Hmm. However, what happens over time is that the externals of something remain. And the internals get lost. And this happens everywhere. I was born in India and I celebrated Diwali for almost 15 years. And for me, Diwali meant two things. 
them blowing firecrackers and eating a lot of food, <laughs> eating sweets. Now that actually, this is the occasion that when Lord Ram came back, I had no idea about it for so many years. Similarly, if we consider Christmas, and for most people, especially children, Christmas is not about Jesus Christ, this is about Santa Claus. What happens on Christmas? Oh, Santa Claus will come and give us gifts. That's all that they remember. So often the nature is that there might be some particular occasion, but that occasion gets forgotten and something else becomes prominent. Krishna talks about this in the Bhagavad Gita when he says, Sakale neha mahata yogo nashtaha parantapa. That by the power of time, things decline and thus that which is pure becomes impure. That which had a particular purpose, things go off purpose. So the original occasion was just an occasion when after a difficult, dangerous journey, they had come to a land where they felt they would get safety and they were happy about that. They were giving thanks for that. Now if you look at the expression, now for most of us, the expression of thanksgiving can appear quite jarring where often it is centered on you know, killing a turkey, decorating a, and then consuming. I said, this is so brutal, you're killing an animal, killing a, killing a life to celebrate. So the Nietzsche, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains that people, he is explaining Chaitanya Shikshamrat, that different people behave that the same one absolute truth reveals himself to different people according to their cultures, their languages, their psychologies, and their levels. So he says that if there's one big mountain peak, now different people at different distances and different directions from the mountain peak will see it differently. So when people want to celebrate, they will all celebrate in a way they think is appropriate. And how will they know what is appropriate? That is what has been taught to them by the culture in which they grew up, by the way they, they lived in the past. So it is true that uh, killing animals, is, killing animals or birds is brutal. And we can look at that and we can be appalled. What kind of celebration is this? But in every tradition, there are two aspects. There's the exoteric aspect and there's the esoteric aspect. There's the external aspect and there's the internal aspect. The external aspect is what strikes the eye the first time. And if we stay, now the externals are important and some externals are good, some externals are not so good. So the Bhagavad Gita talks there are three modes of material nature. Which are the modes? Yeah, so Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, thank you. So basically you could call these three modes in terms of mm, that in goodness we think before we act. In passion we act before we think. So some people speak to express their thoughts. And some people speak to discover their thoughts. They speak, oh, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> they have slips of tongue. So that is Rajoguna. That is Rajas, where there is action without contemplation. And in ignorance, in Tamas, there is neither action nor, neither, neither proper, act, proper action nor proper contemplation, there is simply delusion. So if one some, just keeps doing something, because we have always been doing it. Don't think about it, what we are doing, just live like a, uh, like a robot or like a zombie. They just do what we are to, what we have been doing without thinking. That is Tamas. So now the expression of people may vary depending on what mode they are in or what mode they were brought up in. The author who has written a book that the taste of wine is the proof that God loves us. <laughs> the taste of wine is the proof that God loves us. So, oh, wine is so delicious. How could something so delicious have come about if God did not love us? Now, there are so many things which are delicious. But for that person, their idea is, oh, wine is delicious. 
So, they're still remembering God. The Prabhupada is so inclusive. Prabhupada at one level says that if somebody is a drunkard and they cannot give up drinking, then he says if they can just remember that the taste of wine is Krishna. Is the taste of wine Krishna? Is this now some new Bhagavad Gita which Prabhupada is bringing? In the Prabhupada is adapting what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Raso Hamapsu Kaunte. And I am the taste of water. And Prabhupada says, he generalizes this is a taste of all liquids. So the idea is everything attractive in this world comes from Krishna. Everything attractive. Whatever is attractive in this world, it gets its attractiveness from Krishna. However, although everything attractive comes from Krishna, everything attractive doesn't take us to Krishna. Everything attractive. There's a story of Shankaracharya. Once he was uh, going out with his disciples and they came to a liquor shop. And Shankaracharya picked up a pot of liquor and he drank it. Before drinking, he said, Sarvam Kalmam Idam Brahma. Everything is Brahma. And he drank it. Many of his followers saw, oh, our Gurudev is, Guruji is drinking. So they also picked it up and they also drank. And then after that, soon they came to a iron smith shop and there was molten iron over there and Shankaracharya picked up a glass of that he said Sarvam Khalmamidam Brahma and he drank even that and now none of his followers could drink that <laughs> so there is a higher level of realization where one may be able to see that everything is ultimately spiritual but for us at our level we need to differentiate that this is favorable to my spirituality this is not favorable to my spirituality this is moral, this is immoral, this is beneficial, this is harmful. Pravrittim cha nivrittim cha karya karye bhaya bhaye bandham moksham cha yavetti buddhi sa partha satriki. Krishna says that that intelligence by which we understand what is binding and what is liberating, what is beneficial and what is harmful. That intelligence is good intelligence, that intelligence is sattva. So, meat, uh, so killing animals is bad. And why is it bad? Because life is being taken. It is all life is like us. At one level, we souls have been going through many different bodies. And we might ourselves, the people who are celebrating Thanksgiving by killing a turkey. Maybe in a previous life, they might have themselves been a turkey and they might have been killed. Or they might themselves become turkeys and be killed in the future. So all life is essentially like us. Sarva bhuteshu ye naikam bhavam avyay mikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu tadjyanam vidhisatrikam To see that the essential spark of consciousness in all living beings is the same, is similar to us. That is knowledge. That is the eyes of knowledge, Krishna says. So now, that's why killing is bad. At the same time, there is a, <coughs> there is a difference between Making a judgment and being judgmental. Making a judgment means evaluating. Okay, this is beneficial, this is harmful. Now, that kind of evaluations we have to do all the time in life. If you are driving a car, should I turn left or should I turn right? If I want to pass across someone, if I want to overtake someone, then should I go or should I not go? So these are judgments we have to make constantly in our life. But being judgmental means trying to be superior to others thinking that th this person is bad this, and i am better than them now when we become judgmental then we put people into small small boxes and then we label this is bad this is bad this is good and then what happens we can't perceive things as they are so judgmentality is bad because we do not know where people are coming from. That everybody has a background. Now suppose we saw somebody uh, walking in a very twisted, awkward way. It's just uh, twisted like that and they're walking in a very awkward, unpleasant, odd looking way. You say, why are you walking like this? And then we looked and we saw that they were carrying a, carrying a huge burden on their back. And not only they're carrying a big burden on their back, but also, uh, one of the, their foot was injured and that's why they are walking like that. Or if you saw that the ground below them was slippery and so they were very slowly taking steps. You understand why this person is walking like this. 
so we we don't know what are people's backgrounds to know somebody's background doesn't mean that to find out all the bad things about them so that we can have something to gossip about them to know people's background means to know what is on their back and what is under their ground what is on their back and what is under their ground so yes if somebody has been born and brought up in a way that they think oh, all life form all animals are meant for human beings to eat and we celebrate by killing animals and eating and that is the way they will celebrate so that is just the power of the culture in which we are born our conceptions are often shaped you know in a big way by the place where we are born so rather than just obsessing over this fact oh this that they're killing animals but the point is there is a that is the way they were taught to celebrate now there are two broad ways of looking at meat eating one is to understand that if somebody is eating meat then that is a disqualification for spiritual life the other is to understand that every soul is on a journey of spiritual evolution and different souls will be at different points and sometimes uh, we may impose our conceptions on them sometimes we may feel that oh i am not eating meat i am pure these people are eating meat they are impure it's not like that necessarily why because in other aspects of their life the people may be very nice gentle kind but this is what they've just been brought up with and that's what they're doing most of us when we live our life we don't really think about doing every single thing that we do we just do most of the things that are just the way they are done say for example birthday celebrations how do most people celebrate birthdays what do you do cake, cake. what do you do with the cake yeah but along with that blow a candle isn't it now do you know why we blow candles <laughs> it's a yeah it's a it's a very it's such a common practice but the original story behind it is that long ago in scandinavia almost 500 600 years ago there was this belief you could say a superstition that on for a small child on every birthday a evil spirit haunts the child and when you blow out a candle that evil spirit will go out of the body it will not haunt now today people don't believe in most people don't believe in evil spirits and top of that how blowing out a simple blowing out a candle will cause a evil spirit to go away you don't know that but still all that people do is everybody gathers around the time light candles and they blow out the candles so so in so many things in our day to day life we do which we don't ask questions why we do it some for some of them there are some reasons which make sense some of them there are reasons which don't make sense but the point is that the capacity to examine life from a objective perspective is rare most of us go along with the business of living without really thinking about how we are living so if we consider this point that different people will express their particular emotions in different ways so we don't get so obsessed with the expression so in the vedic tradition also there was some belief some people started taking the idea that the vedas say that we should sacrifice animals and animals started being sacrificed and then afterwards it became so widespread that animals started being killed more and more and more and the yagya was left on the side the animal killing became the main thing and then different acharyas came and they taught different things buddha came and told one extreme thing he said that don't you, you cannot give life you have no right to take life and if you say the vedas say this then just give up the vedas only so buddha taught what we call as nastikvada he rejected the vedic authority but ramanujarya madhvacharya who were acharyas in the vedic tradition they taught something different they said they quoted from the puranas and they quote, and they said that actually you don't need to sacrifice animals you could just make a replica of grains so those people who are too attached to the external oh we have to cut a cut a goat 
or you cut a, cut a particular animal, cut a, uh, whatever kind of animal you might have. You want to, you want to sacrifice that animal. Then he said, make an animal of wheat. Make a effigy. Make an effigy of wheat. And offer that into the fire. And that's enough. And that's how what they did was they brought people back to morality. The morality of not killing other animals. So the Bhagavatam says in the 11th canto that um, illicit sex, intoxication and meat eating are the, are the ways of people in general. Pravrittir esha bhutana nyuruttistu mahafalam And this is the way most people will act. But if somebody doesn't act that way, then they can get a great fruit. What is that great fruit? The more we become sensitive to life around us, the more we become sensitive to life inside us. The more we appreciate that other living beings feel pain, the more we become conscious of our own consciousness. So, uh, let's, so this is the expression. So rather than getting too caught with the expression, uh, we can understand that different people will express things in different ways. So we move forward to the intention. So I talk about the occasion, I talk about the expression. And rather than we make a judgment that this is not right, we don't become judgmental, saying that this should not be done. These people are terrible because they do it like this. No. If people are guided, many people change things. So there are devotees in different parts of the world, especially in the Western world, on Thanksgiving, they arrange for a spiritual feast. And there is no need is for people to go out. When people are provided better alternatives, often people give up the unwanted things. So let's move on from there to the intention part. But at this point, are there any comments or questions? Yes, please. Uh, so I appreciate the point of not being judgmental about someone who is engaging in a sinful activity because they may have been brought up like that. We also hear that um, if you see someone flying a kite on a roof, backpedaling, without the fall off, mm. you should say something. Yeah, that's so true. So we see that, um, a, a simple example is, um, when my sister was having an engagement party, mm. so I, I was living in Latra at the time, so I came up and my mother said, are you gonna go? And I said, no. And she said, what do you mean you're not gonna go? I said, I'm not gonna go and see the people I love commit sinful activities. So we had a discussion, and she finally agreed to have it catered by devotees so that they would eat prasada. My point is that shouldn't some effort be made to help someone without mm. being judgmental? Yeah, that's true. Or um, you can think that uh, if this person became, he may be engaging in a sinful activity now, but if he stops, he'll actually be a better devotee than me. So let me just try that. That's true, yeah. So we often say that. If somebody is about to, while playing a kite, fall off of a big building, should we stop them? Like that if people are doing wrong activities, should we stop them? Should we speak something to alert them and stop them? Yes, definitely. The challenge is that with respect to a kite, you can easily <coughs> see that they're going to fall down. And they can also see it. Yeah. But with respect to, in today's world especially, people think of morality as subjective. Mm. And they say, okay, you think that is wrong? I don't think it is wrong. So we need some rational way to persuade people why they are doing, why, why what they are doing is wrong. And to the extent we can do that. So what happens, we may say we want to be compassionate. But most people don't think that I want to be the object of your compassion. <laughs> most people think I am good. Who do you think I am? Suppose say, somebody comes suddenly and tells you, I forgive you. Thank you very much. But what did I do to deserve your forgiveness? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> we'll ask like that. So basically, most people don't think that they're doing anything wrong. And right and wrong itself is considered to be a relative concept today. Mm -hmm. So that is why when we are to tell somebody that, uh, that they should not do something, it has to be done in a way that is persuasive to them, not in a way that is alienating to them. In fact, uh, uh, I read an article about uh, postmodern attitudes. The world is largely in a postmodern state. So it's so relative. So there was a, one article that says, it is sinful to use the word sinful. <laughs> 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 to say that something is sinful. He says, who are you? It is such, it's, it's such a moralizing word. He says, you don't, shouldn't use that word. 
So I feel that if we can, as at least with respect to meat eating, we can make a very sound case ba based on just uh, human sensitivity, human sensitivity, even health. <coughs> almost anybody who gets a heart attack, they're told give up red meat, at least red meat. Mm -hmm. So almost everybody, all medical professionals agree that in on many, many counts, vegetarian food is healthier, even environmental point of view. So I have an article on my website, The Spiritual Scientist, where I talk about how your food can help the world. Mm -hmm. So help is H-E-L-P. So four points, how vegetarian food is better than non-vegetarian. H is for our own health. E is for the environment. Because much of the pollution that is there, much of the, uh, whether it be greenhouse effect or global warming or climate change, whatever is happening, that is because of the huge amount of animals that are produced, in, that are then factory farms. Mm -hmm. And they, they emanate gases and other they pollute the environment and l is livestock you see animals suffer terribly uh, uh, there's a quote that if slaughterhouses had glass walls nobody would be a meat eater <laughs> so just seeing how animals are brutalized and p is poverty actually a large amount of poverty and starvation in the world can be mitigated if people switch over to a vegetarian diet because normally what happens is when animals are fed, so where are they going to be fed from? They are fed through grains and those grains are grown on farms and those farms could be used to grow grains for humans but when they are used to grow grains for animals then it's almost on average the amount of land that is used to feed one non-vegetarian person, that much land can be used to feed 12 vegetarian people. So we could make a rational case. So unless we are able to help people understand that what they are doing is wrong, uh, just telling them they are doing something wrong, that doesn't work. So there is, a, there is a time and place where we can tell people these things. At the time and place where we might just decide that this is not something which we can tell at this place. But in general, uh, especially in the Western world now, vegan, being vegan is becoming quite cool. Actually, India is almost 20-30 years behind the West. So in India, being non-vegetarian is cool. They say, if you become, if you're modern, oh, stop eating. Yes, start eating non-vegetarian, then you become modern. So it's a little back, they got it backward. But overall, uh, it's a fair point that we need to tell people without being judgmental. Thank you. Any other comments, Okay. So I'll move on. One question, but you may want to put it aside because it may leave us off track. Because you're making the point that it's, you know, to kill a living entity like a turkey to eat it gets very cruel. But I, we hear all the time from the vegans that you're killing living entities also in the form of vegetables. Okay, so we are killing vegetables. I have a three-point answer to this broadly. First is that, you, yeah, the question is that, you say that uh, killing animals is bad, but even killing vegetables and plants also is bad. So I talk about this three times, three, three ways. First is that if we purely from the scientific perspective we consider uh, if, we, if we have to cause pain, we should cause as less pain as possible. Mm -hmm. Then if there is a very painful treatment available, there is a painless treatment available, less painful treatment available. So we should cause. So we cannot live without eating some food. And the nature of life is that one life feeds on another. But in general, animals uh, have far more developed nervous system than plants. So plants don't suffer as much as do animals. And even from the soul's point of view, the soul's consciousness is much more developed in animal body. So it experiences more pain and pleasure conversely as compared to in a plant's body. So at, at the very least, we can say that least pain is caused. Second is that in many cases, you can eat vegetarian food without causing any violence also. So for example, fruits, just fall off the tree. The fruits actually, uh, they are not vital parts of a tree that are essential for survival. The fruits will anyway fall off and rot, but if we take the fruits and we eat them. So animal flesh is not like that. So thirdly, or related with that, that natural provision itself, if we consider with respect to crops and grains. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when the grains grow, if they are not harvested, they are going to rot and die. Mm -hmm. So it's not that 
we are doing anything uh, we are just using what nature is providing so if it's not Prabhupada would often say that if at all you have to eat meat he says let the animals grow old live their life and when they are about to die when they die naturally you eat them at that time so with respect to grains it's like that if we don't harvest them then we will we will naturally uh, they will naturally die on their own so we are not actually in that sense uh, shortening their life we are, uh, there is some amount of pain, but that pain is just inevitable. Mm -hmm. They're going to die anyway. And lastly, even from a purely aesthetic perspective, if there's a farm where there's harvesting happening, now, harvesting is a time of celebration. People dance and sing and have festivals. And suppose, even if there's somebody who's a hardcore vegan, you tell them, okay, you have a child, and then we want to take the child for an outing. So you want to tell, take the child to see a harvesting festival and say, and you want to take your child to a slaughterhouse. Now, which would they allow? You know, a slaughterhouse, any time you go, there's no celebration over there. It's brutality, it's pain, it's horror, it's filthy, it's messy. So intuitively, we understand that actually, uh, when we are harvesting crops, its nature is giving its bounty and we celebrate that bounty. So there is a huge amount of difference between eating uh, vegetables and eating, uh, eating animals. And of course we also understand that's why if being vegetarian alone is not enough, we also need to take the vegetarian food and offer it to Krishna and take the Krishna Prasad. But even if somebody doesn't want to get in the religious dimension of it, but still even from the uh, logical perspective there is in many cases vegetarian food does not involve any, involve any uh, unnecessary violence okay thank you yeah um, about this topic of vegetarianism yeah um, people people nowadays say that okay we want to eat any meat but then argue that why can't we have egg because it's not like a fully living being Okay. What about eggs? They are not fully living beings. Well, <clears throat> there is potential life over there. The egg is the env environment. The egg is, is the uh, is the you could say the uh, the egg eventually will hatch and give a chicken or whichever generally people humans eat eggs, which are yolk chickens. So there is potential life over there. So although there is no life right now, but there is a cycle in nature and in that cycle in nature at a preliminary level there is um, that there, there is a potentiality for life over there you know there are there was some some big scandal discovered in china where what they did was they were uh, they were doing abortion of children and because china had this policy of one or none you should have only one child or no child so if the parents would become somehow pregnant if the, the women would become pregnant, then they would have forcible abortion. So what happened was they were these embryos which were aborted, they were they just they were meant to be discarded. But there's a whole racket involving them. And there are a group of people who actually started eating these embryos and started delighting in them. So eventually when they were caught, they were uh, they were treated, they were severely punished and condemned. It was a form of cannibalism. Now, cannibalism, according to civilized human society, is a terrible crime to kill another human being. So just as we consider uh, killing a potential, consuming, eating a potential life in the form of an embryo as also a form of cannibalism, similarly, eating a potential life in the form of eggs is also a form of, uh, form of violence. So, you would like to add something to? The, the eggs that people eat do not have, and they're not fertile eggs, they're not chickens. It's, there's no chicken in because if there is, they discard them, they, they don't use them. So they, 
Because yeah. actually they keep them separate. They keep the, the roosters separate from the chickens. So it's not very natural. But then there is no life. I mean, what I generally tell people, I can tell you a quick story. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> one time I was Santa Claus. <laughs> we used to go out with Santa Claus. And, uh, and a whole, whole, whole Merry Christmas, uh, you know, get donations like that. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Whole, whole Merry Christmas. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, one time there was this young couple, and they had an ice cream. And they asked me, uh, Santa, would you like some ice cream? I said, no, 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 no. And she said, why not? I said, well, it might have eggs. They said, what's wrong with eggs? I says, oh, 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 it's a menstrual period of a chicken. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> and they said, Santa, you're so gross. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you're the one that's eating it. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Actually, the, the, that's a good, it's a good way of answering that question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think over a period of time, there has been a whole process by which uh, these two get separated at the eggs which fertilize and eggs which don't fertilize. But that kind of separation is not there in nature. So we artificially do it and then they try to put in more chemicals in the chicken so that it will give more of uh, non-fertilizing eggs. So they are, so ultimately we could go back to nature and say that, uh, is it a natural food for human beings? Mm. It is, it is, we are artificially, artificially, genetically or chemically manipulating the chicken so that it will give more non-fertilizing eggs and less fertilizing eggs. That's not the way it is in nature. So, thank you. Yeah. So let's move on to the last part of the talk, which is about the intention. The intention is to express gratitude. So <clears throat> when we talk about gratitude, I'll talk about this in three main parts. That in our life, often bad things happen. And we can't be grateful for we can't be grateful for all the things that happen in our life. We can't be grateful for all situations because bad things do happen in life. But we can be grateful in all situations. We can't be grateful for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. That's what I'll talk about. But before that, now why do we need to be grateful? That's because if we are not grateful, then we are great fools. <laughs> we are great fools. Why? Because if you are not grateful, we will inevitably gravitate towards being resentful. And, oh, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right in my life, that is not right, that is not right. And when we go in that direction, we just subject ourselves to negativity more and more. So, if we are resentful, being resentful is like trying to drive a car with your foot fully on the brake. We just waste energy and create a lot of noise. That, no, there's no moment, no moment happens. So the opposite of grateful is resentful. And sooner or later, if you are not grateful, our mind will take us towards being resentful. And that simply chokes us. Chokes us in our capacity to do things, chokes us in our capacity to relate with others, chokes us in our capacity to even think clearly. Now, why didn't this work out? Why is this happening like this? Why, why, why? So when bad things happen, it is easy to become resentful. And when we become resentful, we hurt ourselves. So simply from a pragmatic perspective, being grateful is a far healthier emotion than being resentful. Now, of course, we could take it from a spiritual perspective. And many times now, because the world is moving towards secularism, they call it secular humanism, people try to have virtues without God. People want to be good without God. They say, I want to be, I want to be grateful. But grateful to whom? No, I am not grateful. I am, but grateful to whom? Oh, I am grateful to the universe. But what is the universe? The universe doesn't even know that you exist. Hmm? 
so people want to divorce the good from God so that's like saying if to say I am grateful in general is like saying I'm married in general whom are you married to no no I'm married in general now marriage is not in general you know marriage is in particular <laughs> it's to a person that we are married so similarly to be grateful in general is actually artificial unless we have an object for gratitude the emotion of gratitude will not stay for long so how do we uh, if we consider the emotion of gratitude is helpful to us but how do we cultivate this gratitude said so we can <clears throat> do it in three broad ways as i gave a seminar in <clears throat> washington dc on this topic of ace your life with gratitude ace means it's acronym a c e a is around c is counter and e is emerge what that means is that when something bad has happened in our life we look around the bad to see all that is good in our life usually when something bad happens in our life when problems come problems just don't come in our life problems come and then they expand or fill our mind that we can't think of anything except the problem but even if something terrible has happened in our life there are many other things which are good in our life so look for the good around the bad so even if some our health has got spoiled some relationship is going downhill our job situation is precarious there are so many other things that are right in our life so now to look for the good around the bad we need to have the habit of looking for the good that's why uh, try making us a habit every day i'll thank krishna for three things in my life whatever it is that day i felt their value so what we do like this when we make a list of the blessings that are there in our life many people say count your blessings that's too important we need to count our blessings and we need to make our blessings count make our blessings count means that when we don't feel blessed in our life that when we feel as if we are cursed as if we are condemned at that time we need to shift our consciousness to the blessings and yes this is right in my life this is also right in my life this is also right in my life so make blessings count so this this is big blessings count means when a bad thing is dominating our consciousness at that time we look for the good and if you have written down the good things in our life we can direct our consciousness towards them and remember them then beyond that uh, after that a uh, second thing is we look for the good that helps us to counter the bad yes we may say okay all these things are good in my life but this is still bad yes this is bad but okay among the good things that i have how can i how can this help me to deal with that so for example if i got some disease then okay i got this disease that's a bad thing but i'm grateful that i have overall good health so there's a good chance i'll recover from the disease i'm grateful that i have health insurance i'm grateful that i have a supportive family i am grateful that i have a helpful community i'm grateful that the disease is curable so we can look for the good specifically that helps us to counter the bad and in every situation it's a matter of focus if we can either focus on the problem and just feel disempowered or we can focus on what we have to deal with the problem and then feel empowered by that if not empowered at least feel equipped yes i can do something about it and this is where our intelligence needs to be in sattva if our intelligence is in uh, rajas or tamas in the modes of passion or ignorance the intelligence in if our overall consciousness is in ignorance then we will keep lamenting about that which is wrong this why did this happen why did this happen why did this happen in we are, if we are in too much in passion in rajas then we will be hankering if only it had been like this if only it had been like this if only it had been like this well it is not like that now we have to deal with life as it is and a so, sattva the mode of goodness helps us to look at not be obsessed with the bad that has happened or not stay long uh, long lo, not lamenting about the bad that has happened not longing for the good that we wish would have happened but looking for the good that will help us to counter the bad and then the third 
E A, I said ACE, A C E. So the good around the bad, the good that helps us to counter the bad, and the good that will emerge from the bad. Many of the things that feel bad to us right now, yes, they may be bad, but there is a higher plan to life. And sometimes it is through the difficult things in our life that we grow. Often life is like a fire. And it is like in, in the fire, when gold is put, all the impurities around the gold, they melt away. And then the gold shines forth much more. So similarly, when we face difficulties in life, that time all the things that are peripheral to us, we we, are, we leave them. What really matters to me? And that emerges forward. The soul can become purified and glorified through adversity. When Srila Prabhupada came to America, you know, he could have had so many things which he could have seen as they were they're bad. And he was all alone. He was, uh, he was old. He did not have any contacts. From India, nobody was supporting him. Even his godbrothers didn't support him, the Indian government didn't support him, Indian businessmen didn't really want to support him. So, it was terrible. But the good that emerged from it was that Prabhupada single-handedly, without any support from India, established the Krishna Consciousness Movement. He got support, but it was from people whom he attracted. So, that makes Prabhupada's accomplishments even more glorious. So, sometimes when the bad is happening, the bad may actually give way to good in the future. So in general, if you look at nature, the way nature works is that it breaks things to provide something better. When clouds exist in the sky, the clouds are practically no use to humanity. The clouds simply exist. But nature breaks clouds to provide rains. And then when the rains, they are there on the ground, they fall on the ground. But the soil, if it is just flat, then the soil doesn't produce anything. By, when soil is when the ground, soil is broken through plowing, that is when grains come out. When we get bread or we get chapati, the bread or chapati may look very nice, but unless we break it, we can't eat it. So similarly, even when we take in the food, the body breaks the food down so as to provide energy from it. So in general, the rule of nature is things are broken so that something better emerges from it. So if we just stay caught in the bad that is happening right now, then we feel, why is this happening? And that question, the, why is this happening? Sometimes you can find an answer to that question. Many times that question is simply the expressway to frustration. This isn't, there's no answer to it. Instead of why is this happening, you can just change the question. No, as I said that we can't be grateful in all situ for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. That means, okay, in this situation, this bad thing has happened, but, but I can look beyond this situation. So for that, we need to change the question that we are asking. See, all the time in our life, we are asking some question and getting some answer. Most of the time, the questions we ask are operational questions. You know, where can I get food to eat? Where can I get earn a better? Where can I earn more money? Where can I have a comfortable house? Basically, our questions are centered around eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. They are operational questions, but there are existential questions. Existential questions means what is the purpose of my existence? Yeah, I am eating, I am sleeping, but ultimately, why am I doing this? If we don't ask existential questions. Then what is our life story? Most people, materialistic people, if you see, their life story can be summarized in four words. Get. They, they want to get. I want to get this. I want to get this. I want to get that. They want to get. Then, then they want to beget. You know, get, beget. They want, and life faces so many problems. They want to turn on some TV and forget. Forget all the problems of life. And then as they grow old, they feel their life, I miss so much. I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. And then the last emotion they have is regret. <laughs> so get, beget, forget and regret. And in the next life, again this goes on. Get, beget, forget and regret. So 
Actually speaking, if you don't ask existential questions, then we just live to die. So there's no ultimate point to life. So sometimes when we face perplexity, that time we can change the question that we ask. Oh, I want to do this, this is not working out. What can, why is this not working out? That question is an, also an operational question. Why is this not working out? But we could change it to a, a more existential question. You know, how am I meant to live? If we study the Bhagavad Gita, we understand that we are souls, we are meant to serve Krishna. So we can ask the question, how can I serve Krishna? How can I serve Krishna? Krishna, how can I serve you in this situation? So if we just change the question from why to how, then we'll find that we can shift from being resentful to being grateful. How can I serve you? Oh, I can still do this. I can still do this. I can still do this. I can still chant Krishna's holy names. I can still associate with devotees. I can still strengthen myself spiritually. And then I can deal with the situation. So I'll conclude with one example. And then if you have any questions, we can discuss. That the Bhagavad Gita gives a beautiful example. In the second chapter, Apuryamanamachala Pratishtam Samudramapaha Pravishanti Yadvad Tadvat Kamayam Pravishanti Sarve Sashanti Mapnoti Nakama Kami That when rivers flow into an ocean, the ocean is not disturbed. Similarly, many stimuli flow into the consciousness of a self-realized person. But the self-realized person is not disturbed. So the point of this example is that worldly stimuli, whether it be desires or whether it be distresses, they will flow into our consciousness. If our consciousness is like an ocean, then they will not disturb us so much. But often, our consciousness is not like an ocean. Our consciousness is like a puddle, a small puddle. Now imagine if in a puddle, a river comes in. What will happen? The puddle, puddle will get overflow and all around it, there will be devastation. So similarly, now, uh, if our consciousness is like a puddle, then if some distress comes in our life, we just can't deal with it. We get overwhelmed by it. Now what determines whether our consciousness is like a puddle or our consciousness is like an ocean? That is determined by our attachment. If we are attached to small things, then our consciousness shrinks. It becomes like a puddle. All that we can think about is this one thing. If I get it, everything is right. If I don't get it, everything is wrong. So you take a small child. Child says, I want this toy. And the parents say, not now, later. No, I want this toy. And no. And the child starts crying. And sometimes the children cry. It's like they are crying with such distress as if it's the end of the world for them. Now they may have 10 other toys, 50 other toys. And not having that one toy doesn't make any difference. But if they're attached to that toy, their whole world shrinks to that one toy. So we grow up physically, but often we don't grow up psychologically. Now all that happens to us is just the toys that we are attached to change. So we're still attached to toy-like things. And when a particular thing doesn't work out, if our consciousness is attached and shrunk in that, then if that one thing is not work out, because our consciousness become like a puddle, that something doesn't work out, if something bad happens with respect to that one thing, just become devastated. The overall Indian subcontinent is quite cricket crazy. So, near India there is Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka for many years was like a runner-up in many championships one two three four World Cup finals there, there's a T20 cricket World Cup all the, they came to finals and they lost in the finals and the fourth time when it happened a number of Sri Lankan fans committed suicide <laughs> the players didn't commit suicide the fans committed suicide so now oh, it's, a, it's a game you win you lose why commit suicide but for them, their world had shrunk so much. Their world had shrunk so much that they just couldn't think of anything else. And they ended their life because they're just so terribly attached. So when what happens is our conscious, we are attached to something, 
then our whole world shrinks to that one thing. It was once India Pakistan were having a cricket match, playing, and India was in a winning position, but it suddenly ended up losing. So there was one person in Punjab, he got so upset that he just wanted to, he wanted to throw something. And in his mad rage, uh, he just, uh, there's a baby in the family, and he picked up the baby and hurled the baby at the wall. And when he realized, the baby screamed and cried and blood and gore went all over. And the baby had to be rushed to the hospital. And this man went so crazy. After that, what, first he went crazy what, and hit the baby on the wall. And after that, when he what did I do? And he banged himself against the wall. And he hit his wall so badly that when the other relatives came back, they found he was unconscious. And he had to be rushed to the hospital. So these are, of course, extreme examples. But the point I'm making is that when we become attached to something, our consciousness shrinks to that one thing. And then, when our consciousness becomes like a puddle, and some the water, so, uh, uh, the river comes into that puddle, then we just can't make, we just can't keep ourselves composed. So, if we want to make our consciousness like an ocean, then what do we need to do? We need to make ourselves attached to something big. See, we are not afraid of problems. We all think problems cause misery. But it is not problems that cause misery. It is that purposelessness that causes misery. When we, if we are walking along a, a forested path and suddenly a thorn pricks us, we'll be angry, we'll be annoyed. Oh, this thorn pricked me. But, say, if we fear that we are going to get tetanus and then we go doctor, and the doctor pricks us with the injection. At that time, what happens? Now we ourselves go to the doctor, put our hand or foot in front of them, and after that we pay them also. The sensation is the same. A thorn pricking us and an injection pricking us. The sensation is the same. But the context is different. We see the injection pricking us as serving some purpose. The thorn piercing us, we don't see it as serving any purpose. So, we can never eliminate problems from life. But when our purpose of life is so small that a problem seems to have sabotaged that purpose, destroy that purpose forever. So, if the purpose of somebody's life is that I want to see my cricket team win the World Cup and they lose it, then that when the problem seems to be bigger than our purpose, then we become crushed. But if our purpose is bigger than our problem, then even if problem comes, we'll persevere through that. So what Bhakti Yoga offers us is these two things. An object of attachment which is bigger than any problem can be. That's the supreme object, Krishna. When we become attached to Krishna, then our consciousness becomes oceanic. And when we attach to Krishna, attachment to Krishna means that we are attached to the purpose of serving Krishna. When our purpose is to serve Krishna, every aspect in our life, whether it is directly we are coming to the temple and doing seva, or it is our family responsibilities, our professional responsibilities, we see all of them as a service to Krishna. And when we have that big purpose, then our consciousness becomes like an ocean. And once our consciousness becomes like an ocean, yes, bad things may still happen. But we'll be grateful still that we have the opportunity to serve Krishna. We'll be grateful that Krishna is still with us in our hearts. No matter what all things go away from us, Krishna always is with us. How far is Krishna from us? What do you think? How far is Krishna from us? He's very far away in the spiritual world. He is. Where is he? He's within our hearts. Isn't it? Yeah. Yes, thank you. He's within our hearts. Even if a person who loves us, hugs us very tightly, that person can never be as close to us as Krishna always is. Now, Krishna is close to us, but we are far away from him. We have turned away from him. But still turning to him also is not very difficult. Even now, Krishna is just one thought away from us. If you just think about Krishna, we can connect with Krishna. If we just think about Krishna, we can experience His presence. 
How do we experience his presence? We may not see Krishna coming in front of us. But just thinking about Krishna will calm us down. This is the miraculous power of Krishna consciousness that if one thinks about Krishna, the mind that is agitated going here and there and everywhere, it will calm down. Yamunacharya, in his, uh, in his Totratna, he says a beautiful verse. He says, Prashantanihi Shesha Mano Rathantara He says, Kante Knitya Kinkara He says that, Bhavantame Vanucharan Nirantara My dear Lord, I just want to go on serving you constantly now. Why? Prashantanihi Shesha Mano Rathantara that my mind was on a chariot, just going wild here, there, everywhere. But ever since, I have understood that I am your servant. And whatever happens in life, two things will never change. Krishna, you are my Lord and I am your servant. And everything else is contextual. How I will serve you, that depends on context. But these things will never change. So ever since that has happened, he says, my mind has become calm. And now what do I want to do? Kadahamai kante ka nitya kinkara praharshai shami sanatha jivitam. It says, now, till now, as my mind was wandering here, there, and everywhere, I was anath. I was shelterless. I was parentless. But now that I am connected with you, I know that you are always there with me, no matter whatever happens in my life. So, all that I want to do now is praharshai shami sanatha jivitam. I just want to delight in the fact that you are my Lord and I want to serve you. And I want to share your glories with others. Kadaham aikanti kanitya kinkaraha. When will I just celebrate the celebrate the reality that I am your eternal servant and you are my eternal master? So for us, if we can strive to connect with Krishna and recognize that Krishna is the asset who is always with us then even if something bad happens in our life, yes, that bad will be there, but we'll understand that our existence is far bigger than that particular bad thing that has happened. And by recognizing that there is so much more to our life than this particular bad thing, we will look at all the other things that are good and we can be grateful even in that situation. So ultimately, the opportunity to serve Krishna, the opportunity to connect with Krishna, that is the thing that we need to be most thankful for. That is the ultimate spiritual significance. You know, this is just for us as devotees. This is, just, this is occasion is just an occasion for us to remind us of our spiritual fortune, of the opportunity to serve Krishna and share Krishna with others. When we consider all of us have difficulties in life, but our difficulties are like the difficulty of a sick person who is in pain but who has been diagnosed accurately and who has been prescribed properly. So there are problems, there is pain, but we are on the path of recovery. We are being treated and we are being cured. For those who do not have Krishna consciousness, they are also in distress. Everybody is in distress in this world. But for them, they don't know what is the disease and they don't know what is the cure. Often they think that the very thing that has caused their disease is the cure for them. So their distress is going to increase more and more. So for us, that we have this knowledge that our disconnection from Krishna is the root cause of our problem and reconnection with Krishna will be the solution to all problem. This is what we have to be grateful for. If a patient is sick in a hospital, it's, it's, yes, it's, there's a painful situation there. But the patient can be grateful that I have a treatment. And for us, this treatment has come by Srila Prabhupada's mercy. When we face difficulties, I find this meditation very helpful. And especially if you read the last five chapters of Lilamrut. Last five. Lilamrut is a biography of Shila Prabhupada, wherein his whole life is described. The first volume of Lilamrut, the first last five chapters where Prabhupada is crying alone in the wilderness in India, somehow struggling to share Krishna, start Krishna consciousness movement. And the first five chapters of the second volume, that is when Prabhupada is alone in America. If you read those 10 chapters, you'll find how much struggles Srila Prabhupada went through just to give us an opportunity to be Krishna conscious. But then, as compared to that, whatever struggles we have, whatever problems we have, they are like insignificant. It's like if a child is sick and is in pain, the child may resent, I am so much in pain. 
child has to take some medicine, the medicine also tastes better, the child says, I don't want to take this medicine. But then the child comes to know that that medicine is very expensive and his mother sold her own jewellery <coughs> to get that medicine. Then the child will say that, the child think that, the child will not taste the bitterness of the medicine, the child will taste the sweetness of the mother's love. And that will make the medicine also palatable. So similarly for us, when we face difficulties in our li daily life, even in our practice of bhakti, sometimes, you know, we may feel bhakti is too difficult. But if you look at that, Srila Prabhupada sacrificed so much to give us the opportunity to practice bhakti. You know, all alone at the age of 70, he travelled across the world to come to America and then from here across the world, he went 14 times. Yeah. So then, when we shift to that, how we have got the opportunity for Krishna Consciousness, then we can be grateful. And then that great gratitude will energize us. Being resentful will paralyze us. Being grateful will energize us. And when we are energized, then gradually if we connect with Krishna, we all have problems in our life. But as we get energy, we get momentum. And as the momentum comes, we find a way to go through those problems. Now if we are just going on a small cycle and there's a big tree blocking us, we will be blocked. But if you are going in a big truck moving fast, the tree is blocking us, we will knock off the tree. Mm. So like that, once we are grateful and we are connected with the supremely powerful being Krishna, then we get a momentum. And by that momentum, whatever problems come our way, we can pass through them and move on in our life. So I will summarize. I spoke today about the theme of the spiritual significance of thanksgiving. I talked about it in three parts. First was the occasion. We human beings want festivals because they break the monotony and the humdrum nature of life. They help us to come together and celebrate. Originally, festivals, the holidays were meant to be holy days. But everywhere, whether it is in Thanksgiving or whether it is Christmas or in, or in Diwali, the externals remain and the purpose is forgotten. So then we talked about the expression of the festival. So occasion, expression and intention. In expression I talked about how different people will express their joy according to their culture and their upbringing. So yes, people celebrate Thanksgiving by killing a turkey. Rather than being judgmental about that, we do make a judgment that that is not good, but we don't become judgmental and condemn people. We, if people are educated and provided an alternative, they can celebrate in a less harmful way also, in a more wholesome way. And then our main talk was on the intention that we need to be, we need to be, give thanks, we need to be grateful. If you are not grateful, then we are great fools because we will be resentful. And by being resentful, we simply uh, paralyze ourselves. Being resentful is like driving a car while pressing, pressing the brake. We get nowhere. And how can we be grateful? Bad things happen in our life. We can't be grateful. In all, for all situations, but we can be grateful in all situations. And for that, I talked about the acronym ACE. When a bad thing has happened, look for the good around the bad, look for the good that enables us to counter the bad, and look for the good that may emerge from the bad. And then I talked about this point, especially of how Krishna consciousness helps us to see beyond the specific problem to all this, look for the good around to counter and emerge. When we, are not, when we are materially attached, our consciousness has shrunk to a puddle. And that's why that one thing is not working, we become, that, 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 that's our toy and it, losing that toy seems to be like the end of life for us. But when we are attached to someone big, the biggest being Krishna, our consciousness expands to becoming like an ocean. And Krishna consciousness gives us a purpose that is bigger than the biggest problems. That purpose is, whatever situation we are in, we can serve Krishna. And then by that, as our consciousness expands, then even if problems come in our life, we are able to deal with those problems because we have a big enough purpose. That is, we are attached to someone big. We know Krishna is in charge, Krishna will take care of things. We look at the good things that Krishna has provided in our life. Ultimately, what is the best thing He has provided? That He has given us Krishna consciousness. Everybody is suffering in life, in material existence. But those who are devoted to Krishna, they are like a sick person who has been diagnosed properly and is being treated, prescribed properly, treated properly. And those who do not know about Krishna, they are neither diagnosed nor treated properly. And they are simply making their life worse many times. 
So by looking at Srila Prabhupada's sacrifice and giving us the opportunity to be Krishna conscious, we can see our problems as not all that big and we can cultivate that, cultivate the attitude of gratitude. And gratitude can energize us so that even if there are obstacles in our life, we are not like a slow moving cycle that gets blocked by a tree, but we become like a fast moving truck which finds its way even through the obstacles and moves on. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you. So any questions or comments? Yes, Mataji. By the way, just, just one. is this a question or a comment? A so, I'm, I'm fine with both. I'm fine with both, but I was just wondering, <laughs> is it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So generally, you know, just like toy, children get attached to toys, we also get attached to certain things. And then those things are not going to make us happy. See, this is a difficult realization to get. If we get it, it's very nice. And we can cherish it. See, broadly speaking, we could say that that idea that material things will not make us happy, uh, this is a realization that comes organically as we advance in bhakti. So bhakti is not so much about saying no to material things, it's about saying yes to Krishna. And the more we say yes to Krishna, it's not that material things can't make us happy, because for the mind to accept that is very difficult. Oh, I can see so many people are enjoying so much. If I get it, I'll become happy. So it, I found that overall, rather than debating whether a particular material thing will make me happy or not, it's better to experience that Krishna makes us happy. That when we practice Krishna Bhakti, when we are absorbed in Krishna, we are happy. We, whether we have little or lot, if we are with Krishna, we are happy. And then when we have that foundation of satisfaction in Krishna, then we can intelligently decide, you know, what I need to aspire for, what I need to not aspire for. So otherwise it can seem a very utopian thing. Don't pursue material things. That realization doesn't last for long. But if you strive to connect with Krishna and experience satisfaction in our connection with Krishna, it's not that in our connection with Krishna we will always be satisfied. Because the mind decides that will be fickle. But when we experience some sublime satisfaction, that is a glimpse of what we can get when we become purified. And then we can get it constantly. Now we get it intermittently. But as we keep practicing bhakti, we will get it more and more. So rather than thinking that material things cannot give me satisfaction, that is true. 
but for the for the conditioned mind it is very very difficult to believe it it's like when when we may give a class and say sense pleasure cannot make us happy we may speak it very forcefully but internally we all privately disbelieve it <laughs> we privately disbelieve it yeah maybe it will make me happy you know so the generally arguing with the mind believe something it like telling a child don't no that toy is not good eh hey, the child is not going to listen if we can give the child something better the child becomes happy with it for the child forget that also so it's better to find out some way we can absorb ourselves in krishna bhakti and then whenever we experience some sublime satisfaction in krishna bhakti we see that as a forerunner a precursor of what we can get if we further go ahead in krishna bhakti and that way it's easier to cultivate so satisfaction we see not as a passivity because passive oh just don't pursue anything in your, in your life that that will that especially for most of us who live in a materialistic society that will be very difficult to apply but what we can see is i am pursuing krishna actively and krishna by doing so little i have experienced so much satisfaction so if i do so much much more how much can i experience it's, and it's about the higher taste right it's exactly yes we focus not on uh, rejecting the lower taste we do have to regulate it to some extent but our focus has to be on getting the higher taste then we will be able to move forwards okay thank you bro feel free if you want to add anything any time if you want to add anything feel free no, Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, Hare Krishna. It will come to you. Yes, Prabhu. Just one minute. Yeah. Yeah, Prabhu, you said uh, when you have the gratitude, you compare the cycle versus the truck. Uh, yeah. So when you have the truck, it's yeah. Like that. In that context, uh, they always say when you do devotional service, you can cross this ocean of nations. Correct. Like yeah. The water contains in a cat's hoof print. Yeah. I I don't quite get that. Can you tell me why it is so easy? Like uh, at the time of death. Okay. So when it is said that if you are attached to Krishna, the whole ocean of material existence will become like a small puddle, and we'll cross over it. So how does that happen by Krishna Bhakti at the time of death? See, the sometimes we think of the material world and spiritual world as geographical locations. Okay, the material world is here, the spiritual world is here. It's like if you on the world map. america is here canada is here so but the spiritual world exists not at another location it exists at another level of reality it's another level it's america and canada are the same level itself on the same physical earth but the spiritual world is at a, at a different level of reality and that's why going to the spiritual world is not so much a physical journey it is a journey of consciousness it is a journey of the heart so that means for somebody who is materially attached then their material desires are like the waves in an the ocean they just keep coming 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 and the ocean seems endless for them but for somebody who is attached to krishna it is not that krishna wants us to stay in this world it is because we want to enjoy the things of this world that's why we are in this world if we have practiced bhakti wholeheartedly and if by the time of death if our if our desire for krishna is stronger than our desire for worldly things then krishna has no desire to keep us in this world the spiritual world so uh, if we still if we don't have a desire for krishna strong enough uh, sometimes like we are chanting hari krishna and then we are thinking you know if you have invested money in a stocks has a stock rate gone up or gone down then we are not yet attached to krishna like that so similarly if suppose we are not attached to krishna and somehow krishna got us to the spiritual world we'll go to the spiritual world and then we'll be thinking what happened in the india pakistan cricket match <laughs> <laughs> is it so unless we are attached to krishna we cannot go to the spiritual world so the vastness of the material ocean is said because there are so many material desires that we have is keep coming one after another after another like waves but if we practice bhakti diligently the process of bhakti spiritualizes our attachment krishna says atha chittam samadhatum na shaknosi mai sthiram abhyas yogena to mam ichchaptum dhananjay 12.9 says if you do abhyas yoga you try to fix your mind on me by that you will get desire for me 
your desire for me will become stronger and stronger. So if we diligently practice Krishna Bhakti, our desire for Krishna becomes stronger and stronger. Then at the time of death, if our desire for Krishna, even if we are not become pure devotees, pure devotees means, say, we desire only Krishna and nothing else. But even if Krishna has become our strongest desire, I have other desires, but this is what I desire the most. Then, Krishna has no reason to keep us in this world. Because then, the, the what makes the material, the ocean of material existence so big, is the desires within it. The desires are the waves, they are the water and which gives rise to the waves in the ocean. But if our desire for Krishna is stronger, then that whole ocean becomes like a puddle. Because Krishna is not far away from us. Krishna can take us to the spiritual world even now. If we just have a desire strong enough for him. In fact, Prabhupada would say that yeah, Prabhupada once was going on a morning walk and um, the devotees wanted to take him to a nice garden area, but somehow they went a wrong path and they ended up in a like a slum or ghetto. It was quite uh, dirty and filthy. They said, Prabhupada, sorry we brought you here. They said, Prabhupada said, This is why Kunta. Hmm. The devotees are shocked and Prabhupada says, You know, we are glorifying Krishna and Krishna is here in the glorification. This is why Kunta. So Prabhupada could feel that even in a tamasic part of the material world. Because ultimately the spiritual world is not a matter of location, it's a matter of disposition. So if our disposition is devoted to Krishna, then Krishna is not something which you have to attain in the future. Krishna is something which we already attained. It's only a matter of time that our body runs its course and then we attain the spiritual world. That's how by, by taking shelter of Krishna's lotus feet, that means by making him our foremost attachment, the vast material ocean will get reduced to a small puddle. Okay? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes, bro. We'll come to you later. Yes. No. Hey, Hare Krishna Prabhu. I'll start with a question and then it will add a little more, more a context to it. So, regarding attachment, is attachment to a service good or bad? That's the question. Uh, and one example could be that uh, a devotee typically they know in their mind or heart that any services they do, kitchen service or any service in temple, it has a bigger purpose that is serving Krishna. Hmm. But consciously or subconsciously in the mind, they are taking or picking a specific service based on whatever reason, maybe hmm. the comfort level or maybe the high, how the popular the service is or they are they more like that, right? So, hmm. uh, so the, they know in the heart the purpose is serving Krishna hmm. but somehow the mind is not taking that right decision. So, in this particular case, if okay. the devotee attached to a specific service, then will it eventually result to resent, resentfulness? Okay, good. Thoughtful question. If a devotee is attached to a particular service, and is selective about doing only that service because it is more comfortable or because they like it more or whatever. And then will that eventually lead to their being resent, resentful if they don't get that service? Yes, I would say that there are levels in bhakti. And I gave a class once in London that we can't become pure devotees without becoming devotees. And that means first we have to start a service. Whatever service we like, we started off. There's a story, once a devotee was doing Kirtan and he used to sing very nicely. So Prabhupada came to that temple and uh, um, Prabhupada just patted him on the back. Nice Kirtan. And he felt so great, so happy. But he said, this is probably the only time I'll get to associate with Prabhupada. So he said, but Prabhupada, sometimes I feel proud. And Prabhupada again patted him on the back. What's wrong with that? And walked away. Now we may say, what's wrong with pride? Pride is a demoniac quality, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, it is at one level. But we have to see that, that it is not that after, sometimes some devotees think, if I am good at a particular service, if I do that service, then I will become proud. But to think that I will become proud is already being proud. Why? Because if I think I will become proud, that means I am thinking right now I am not proud. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so it is not that we are not, we all have pride in our hearts. Just like sometimes you may see a sensually attractive object and then lust gets triggered. It's not that that object makes us lusty. 
It is the lust is already there in the heart that simply activates the lust. So similarly with respect to pride, it is all of us already have pride within us. It is just that right now we may not have any reason to express our pride. I have not done anything glorious. So what have I, what have, what what can I be proud of right now? So but if I do something special, it's not that that will make me proud. That will simply give me a reason to express my pride. So so generally. What happens is if we if we don't do a service which we are good at, and then we say I don't want to become proud. If we can sing nicely, but say if I sing I'll become proud, so I'll not sing. Then what happens? Somebody else is going to do the kirtans, and that person is going to sing nicely, and people are going to praise that person. And what will happen? That same pride will come as envy. If somebody says, you know, see that person sings that devotee sings so nicely. Have you seen how much prasad he eats? <laughs> <laughs> so we will try to find some fault and pull that person down. So basically, at our level, the operational thing is ye na ke na prakare na mana Krishna niveshayat. Somehow or the other, fix the mind on Krishna. So if somebody likes to do a service, well, do that service and start serving at least. That's the, so. If at all somebody is ready to do service, that's wonderful. And in that sense, begin bhakti any way we can. Now, beyond that, for sustainable practice of bhakti, there are two aspects. One is that in general, we want to not just do a service. We want to also cultivate a service attitude. Cultivate a service attitude means we want to understand that I am a servant of Krishna. So if I am only doing the things that I like to do, then am I really realizing I am a servant of Krishna, or am I just doing what I like to do? So that means to learn that mood of submission, to learn that attitude of service, it is good to do services that we don't like to do also. So in that sense, from the devotee's perspective, a devotee should be ready to do whatever service is required. That is the mood of a servant. Servant so means okay, this is required for the mission. This is what I will do now. But at the same time, now from the authorities' perspective, for the authorities' perspective, it is not that uh, they just want to get things done. The devotees' perspective should be: I will, I want, I'll do whatever service I am told to do. But the authorities' perspective should be that the leaders come into that we want to engage devotees in a way that they are happy. We want to engage devotees in a way that they can serve sustainably. <coughs> Generally, if the service is something which you don't like to do, then we will do it because we have to do it. And but then afterwards, if there's nobody pushing us, we may stop doing it. But if there's some service which we like to do, then even if nobody tells us to do it, still we'll continue doing it. And in that way, we'll stay connected with Krishna. So, from a from the longevity of a service perspective, it is good for a devotee to have one major service which they like to do. And then along with that, if there are some other services. Which they are not so comfortable doing, they can do that as a to develop the service attitude. But if the if all the services that we are doing are something which you don't like to do, then what will happen is that our mind will oppose us so much that we will not be able to continue. So ultimately, the service connects us with Krishna, and in that sense, as souls, we should like every service to Krishna. But presently, our connection with Krishna is going through our mind and body. And the mind and body have a particular nature, have a particular set of likes and dislikes. So we can't just neglect the body mind and connect with Krishna directly at the spiritual level. We have to connect with Krishna with the body mind that we right now have. So therefore, it is uh, from the longevity perspective. Varana Ashram was that the system of Varana Ashram was not about dividing society into four castes. The idea was that let people do what they are good at, or to put it in a more uh, Humorous way, Paramount was gifted me with some of his humor, humorous genes now. So everybody has to face problems in life, but the expertise of Varanashram is that it allots to people the problems that they will like to face. <laughs> <laughs> so if there is a if there is a Brahmana, and the Brahmana is told, now in the Bhagavatam there is some verse which says that. If for protecting one's life, one has to speak untruth, one should do that. 
Not for any other purpose, but for this only. Can you find the verse? Brahmana will say, yes. Okay, which pastime can this come? This pastime, this pastime, this pastime. In the Bali Maharaj, you know, Bali Maharaj is told to speak the untruth. Maybe that pastime it is there. So Brahmana will get stimulated by that. Hmm? But if somebody is of a Vaishya nature, uh, like a business nature, if they are told, Look, can you find this verse? They say, hey, Bhagavatam has thousands of verses. Where will I find it? No, you just give the class without the words. Who will notice? <laughs> <laughs> but if somebody who is a Vaishya is told, we want to build a new temple and we want to raise one million dollars for that. Yeah, now I've got something to do. <laughs> but on the other hand, if you have to tell a Brahmana, we want to build a new temple, we want to make one million dollars. The Brahmana will say, you know, after building a temple also, you're going to hear about Krishna. You know, here like this, what is the big deal? <laughs> so, the expertise, so in general, the traditional system was, we engage people in doing what they're naturally gifted at doing. But in our situation, uh, often what we are gifted at is also difficult to know. Because we are such a confused society. It is that to, to, have, to have talent is a gift. To know that we have talents is a bigger gift. And to know that our talent is a gift is the biggest gift. <laughs> we think our talent is my talent, but it is actually Krishna's talent. So, to summarize, this, to conclude this answer, that in general, we should uh, be ready to do whatever service we are told to do. And overall, for longevity in service, it is good to have a service which we like to do. And if sometimes we have to do some services which we may not like to do, then we shouldn't be resentful, we should be grateful that still I have an opportunity to serve Krishna. And gradually we can gravitate towards the service that we like to do. Okay? Thank you. Hare Krishna. One last question. Yes, from. <coughs> Prabhu, you had anything to comment on this particular thing? Yes, I did. Please. I want, if anybody here is a vice who would like to raise funds, <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. You made the point that um, we can be grateful in any situation, but not grateful for any situation. Hmm. So. I'd like to present the idea, the Vaishnava idea, that actually you can be grateful for every situation. And maybe you could comment on that. Mm. So I see that everybody here, myself excluded, are actually sincere aspiring devotees. So my mm. understanding, but or the deeper understanding of the Bhujana Evatma Kritam Vakam verse in the 10th canto, not only is whatever bad befalls me due to what I've done, but because Krishna has directly taken charge of me, he's the one who's administrating that bad. And why does he do that? Simply for my spiritual well-being and advancement. Therefore, if I have the attitude that whatever difficulty I face is Krishna's mercy to help me, I can be even grateful mm -hmm. for that. And we see in the Bible time examples of that. So Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I feel it's a good point. That can a devotee be grateful? for all situations also. Yeah, I think a better way of putting my statement would be, even if we can't be grateful for all situations, we can still be grateful in all situations. So it's possible for a devotee to be grateful for all situations, seeing everything as Krishna's mercy. Uh, having said that, sometimes we, uh, we may set the bar of spirituality so high that it might just appear impractical to everyone. And then bad things do happen in life. And I, I had not seen anywhere, say, in the Mahabharata, Mahabharata 110,000 verses, a huge book. Nowhere does Draupadi say that I am grateful that I was disrobed. Nowhere does Sita say that I was grateful that I was abducted. So uh, there are situations, even with respect to Srila Prabhupada, uh, in the final. Actually, when Prabhupada says in a lecture, lecture or a conversation that when he was going on the streets of Delhi and he was distributing back to Godhead, at that time a cow came and hit him and Prabhupada knocked down. So Prabhupada said, I was thinking, why is this happening? So it is just a natural human response. Sometimes if we raise the bar of spirituality so high that there are natural human emotions which we say that you should not have this emotion also. Then it becomes, 
it becomes uh, emotionally unhealthy spirituality. There are certain emotions that are natural to us in certain situations. And if, if we tell somebody you should not feel this emotion, it, it's emotionally unhealthy. See, our, the mind is a reality of its own. Just like the body is a reality of its own. Say, uh, if somebody is feeling physically very cold, now if we tell them, if you are a serious devotee, you should not feel cold. <laughs> well, what do you mean? You know, I am feeling cold. My seriousness may be that even if it is cold, still I will, I will, I'll do my service. But you tell me I don't, shouldn't feel cold. That's not going to work. Now it can be that different people have different bodies. So some person, people may feel very cold at a particular situation. Others may not feel cold at that situation. So the important thing is not whether we feel cold or not. The important thing is that we are determined to serve Krishna. And some devotees may not mind winter so much. Some devotees may just dread winter. And when winter gets over, they big relief. So that, that's just the body that it is. So just as we understand that if some people's body is in a particular way, then we can't expect them to deny their body. Uh, bodily sensations. Mm. Same, I would say with respect to the mind. Mm. Some people are more sensitive than others mm. with respect to certain things. And mm. if something terrible happens to someone mm. and to tell them that it is Krishna's mercy, to see Krishna's mercy in the situation, it may, it may lead to them resenting Krishna. It is very difficult when a bad thing has happened to see Krishna as the cause of that bad thing. And I don't even know philosophically whether Krishna is the cause of the bad thing that happened. We could say it is our own karma, it is other people's wrongdoings. Uh, when Abhimanyu is killed, now Arjuna is not a sentimental person, Arjuna is a battle hardened warrior, but he breaks down and cries bitterly. And Krishna doesn't tell him that everything is my plan. You know, have faith in me. Krishna doesn't even say, have faith in me. He just consoles him as a friend. So, philosophically, it seems uh, nice to say that uh, that uh, Krishna, that we should be grateful to Krishna for all situations. But practically, it is very, very difficult. It is too unrealistic a demand. Now, I was let me just complete this point. That um, I was uh, at a hospital giving a talk, and after that, one young mother came to me. And she was saying that her child is born with some disease and that disease is that there are some germs in the eyes of that child. And those germs are like, not like germs, not even germs, they're like worms. And those worms are continuously biting the child's eyes from inside. And they can't remove those germs because of some other, some other complication. The child, whenever he's awake, he's crying and screaming. Now, can I tell that mother, that this is Krishna's mercy. It will be monstrously insensitive to say that. So Krishna is not the cause of our suffering. Krishna is the cure for our suffering. And to say that the suffering is coming by Krishna's plan, Krishna's will, it's very difficult. It's very difficult practically, emotionally to accept something like that. And philosophically also, we sometimes give pat answers to difficult questions. It's our own karma. But the Bhagavatam, you see, in the Bhagavatam, at least not in the Bhagavatam, in the Mahabharata Ramayana, nowhere have I seen when a person is suffering, somebody else tells him, you are suffering your own karma. No one does that. Even when the Pandavas, they come to meet Bhishma Pitama. At that time, uh, Bhishma says, oh, 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 kashtam, oh, anyayam. oh, how terrible it is that you are suffering this. And he analyzes various causes for suffering. But he doesn't say it's your karma. And ultimately he just tells them to take shelter of Krishna. So in the same first canto itself, when the cow and the bull are being uh, are assaulted by Kali and Parikshit Maharaj comes over there. So Parikshit Maharaj, he chastises Kali, but before he deals with him, he asks the cow and the bull, Oh, please tell me who is the cause of your, what is the cause of your suffering? Now that question itself might seem absurd. You saw this bull was beating me. Why are you asking me this? Isn't it? And the bull's answer is even more absurd. The bull answers saying that actually 
different philosophers say that there are different causes of suffering. Some people say it is the nature of the world, some people say it is the mind, some people say it is karma, some people say suffering is an illusion. Some different people say different things. After hearing all these philosophers, I find it impossible to know what is the cause of my suffering. And on top of that, what does Parikshima say? Bravo! He says, you are a very intelligent person. You are such an excellent answer. That means that uh, the point here is we, we can't just look, give pat answers to difficult questions. We have to see what answer works for people. And what answer is philosophy also is very complex. So in my understanding, to ask anyone to be grateful for all situations is, is generally a very emotionally unhealthy demand. Why emotionally unhealthy? Because then they will feel, because I can't be grateful, so I cannot be a devotee. Well, no, even if you can't be grateful for this bad thing that has happened, be grateful for other things that are good in your life. Take shelter of Krishna and deal with the situation. If somebody can be grateful for the bad situation also, that's wonderful. But my point is that let's not insist on something which is very difficult. If I, that Vaishnava perspective can be in certain situations, a devotee can be grateful for the bad things also. But it is not something which is a standard philosophical point that has to be applied to everyone. That's my humble submission. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, idea of uh, easy on others and hard on oneself definitely applies. I had, I wasn't thinking in terms of preaching to others because the Bhagavatam does give examples. Parikshit and Vidura, who did ex to did accept difficulties that came to them as Krishna's uh, uh, you know, giving Krishna giving them a chance to advance. M my thinking was that at least in my own yeah. practices. If with my intelligence I can understand that point, even I recognize my mind and emotions aren't in line yet with my intelligence, mm -hmm. there's a shelter there for me that helps me to tolerate my mind and senses, you know, rebellion against mm -hmm. the situation that takes place. Yeah, if that helps, then that's definitely true. Even if he's considered the example of Parikshita and uh, Vidura, can you, Paramount, you can pass on the mic. So, even if you consider Parikshita and uh, Vidura, now they were grateful for that particular situation, but then he saw that opportunity and he moved on. So in that situation, relatively speaking, it is, it is not very difficult. Because it is perfect. But for many of us in our particular situations, it may not be that easy to see that. So Krishna consciousness is not necessarily, there is no one way to be Krishna conscious. Kind of analysis can help. Some person is more emotional, then they need a shelter which is more in, in line with which honors their emotional side. So I think we, there, there are many different ways in which you can be Krishna conscious in the same situation also. Yes, yes Prabhu, please. I was thinking, I was thinking, Sri uh, Prabhupada is advantageous for spiritual life. Hmm. So we can take advantage of that and make spiritual advancement. Yeah. I mean, Yeah. She's grateful that she took advantage of that situation and surrendered to Krishna. Yeah, so I think uh, we, we have to see that anything that does happen That's true. can be advantageous for spiritual life. It's up to us how we deal with what happens to us. Yes, definitely. So the Gopati is a shelter of Krishna. It actually manifested Krishna, uh, reached, led to Krishna manifesting as unlimited sari. That's true. I say that is the same part of what I said about emerge. You know, something wonderful emerged from that. So A C E. So when we are going through that situation, at that time it's very difficult to know why this is happening. So later on, actually almost all of us, if you look back at our lives, the things which we thought were bad, something good has emerged from them. But at that time, how do we grapple with it? So at that time, if I am told be grateful for this also, that might be too emotionally difficult. But if it is possible for someone, that's that's great. Whatever works for us. Thank you very much.
सो थैंक यू वेरी मच द प्रभुपाद की गौर भक्त वृंद की दाय गौर प्रेमानंदे जय चैतन्य चरण प्रभु की जय प्रभुपाद की